tell three or four or five or ten people about it and get them plugged in this morning. I believe you will be encouraged by this message as we continue on the series Planted. Last week we looked at the seed. Who is the seed? Jesus. You were real confident about that. You paid attention. You meditated it on this week. Christ is the seed according to Galatians the third chapter verse 16 and he has been implanted in our lives and he is an incorruptible, indestructible, ever-growing seed within us. Paul said that we may grow, the seed has been planted, so we need to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> that knowledge just isn't to ascend to a place of knowledge and be a Gnostic. It is a growing seed within us because the more we know about God's grace and the person of Christ, Jesus said it this way to Peter when he said that thou art the Christ. He said, now let me tell you who you really are. So as we have a revelation of who Jesus is, it brings about a revelation of who we truly are. That's very important in our lives because if we don't know who he is we'll never know who we are and we'll walk in our in a wrong identity and we will have an identity crisis and that in my opinion is what is the beginning issue of sin from the beginning because they were already created in the image and in the likeness of God himself I've lost my glasses There they are. Yeah, hit 50 and you can't see the words on the pages without them. And then I have bifocals because when I was using readers and I looked down, I saw the scripture, but I looked up and it was just a big old blur. So I kept taking my glasses off, but I do have bifocals now. Just telling my age. Throughout the Old Testament, there are many types, shadows, and metaphors that prophesy and point us to the coming Messiah, Jesus born in a manger, the incarnation of God himself in the flesh. So a lot of metaphors and things in the scriptures. It was rare to find a metaphor in the Old Testament that foreshadows the church or the bride of Christ, the bride of Messiah. I found one in the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, if you want to go there, but you're going to put your little string or your gum wrapper there because we're actually going to start in Genesis because I need to build on and get a foundation for this theme that flows throughout Scripture that starts in Genesis and it's, it flows throughout and it's the theme of the garden. Okay, Because we're talking about planted. We know the seed was planted, but if the seed just is planted and we don't know that it grows and it releases fruit and fragrance, we have to understand this theme of the garden. So go with me to Genesis, the second chapter, verse 8. We find God had planted a garden in Eden, and he had placed Adam there. Verse 9 says that there God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, and that they were pleasing to the eye, and good for food. Now, there's not too many pizzas that have not been pleasing to my eye. But they were rather not only pleasing to the eye, but pleasing to the mouth and the taste. So the fruits of the garden of the trees, Jesus or God told Adam and Eve that they could have any of all of these trees to eat from, that they were pleasing to the sight and to the taste. Then verse 10 says that there was a river there in the water, that watered the garden. Pay attention to that scripture. Short little verse. There was a river in that garden that watered the garden. We're going to come back to that at the very end of the message. Verse 15 says, And God took Adam and put him in the garden of Eden to work it, to tend it, and to care for it, watch over it. A part of that is where God God said in Genesis 1.26 that you should be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. To, dominion is what 
Adam, God gave to Adam in that garden that he could have all of the trees to eat within that garden. The Living Bible says the Lord God placed the man Adam in the garden of Eden as its gardener to tend and care for it. I want you to look at the screen and I want you to write that down or lock it into your mind for meditation this week. The first Adam was a gardener. God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden as a gardener. But the last Adam is also a gardener. We'll see this play out today. But we must understand that the first Adam was a gardener, tending and caring for a garden in Eden, paradise. But the last Adam, Jesus, is also a gardener. Genesis 3 reveals to us then that right smack dab in the middle of a beautiful, productive, fruitful garden, there was a snake. In your beautiful garden, as you walk along this journey with God, and you are being productive and fruitful, as He produces fruit in you, do you know that there are snakes in your garden? Every time I hear that, just because of, the way that I think, I hear Woody from Toy Story saying, there's a snake in my boot. <laughs> there's a snake in my garden. But thank God we heard last week from chapter 3 of Genesis verse 15 that the seed of woman, Christ, would crush the head, which I think head there refers to uh, your inferior mindset of who you are. And it's been crushed by what Jesus did for us on the cross. And now we have the mind of Christ. That reveals to us by the Spirit, just like the song said, I, He is mine and I am His. But they ate from the wrong tree because of a snake that deceived them about their identity. Because of their failure to maintain and take care of what God had produced and because of their broken focus from all that they had been given to the one thing that they didn't have, their entire culture shifted. It's amazing to me how many times I encounter people and in conversations with people I hear about what they don't have. And they have broken focus about all that they do have. And Adam and Eve lost focus from all that they had. And instead of focusing on the one thing, they focused on one thing. I'm, I'm going to repeat that. Instead of focusing on the one thing, walking in the cool of the evening in the garden with God, having communion with God, and having the ability to have dominion over the garden, to tend it, to care for it, and eat of all of its fruit, they focused on one thing, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they ate from that, their whole culture shifted. And as people in today's society, in the church realm today, as long as we continue to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we have a wrong mindset. Our concept of God is uh, just out there somewhere. And then our concept of ourselves is skewed. And because of that, we walk in a path where our culture has shifted and we're not focusing on the one thing. I hope that makes sense. Now this particular situation in Genesis the third chapter by classical theologists is called the fall of man. And it may be the fall of man but it was not the fall of God because God did not forsake them. God did not just leave them on their own. He came after Adam because God Himself is indeed a gardener too. And He was caring for the soul and the life of Adam and Eve. Go with me to Romans, the fifth chapter. I promise you we're going to get to the Song of Solomon. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 19. And it says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Circle that word, made. That word made there is a Greek word that means to be exhibited. So by Adam's disobedience, because of an inferior mindset, because of sin, 
He, all of us, were made sinners. Now, the verse doesn't stop there. For by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Circle that word made. Because of what Christ did, you are exhibited to the world and to God Himself as being righteous. I have a question to ask you, and I want you to com- contemplate. When you look at this verse, it talks about the first Adam and his disobedience. Then it talks about the second Adam and his obedience. Which is greater? The last Adam, I'm sorry, yes. The first Adam's disobedience, the last Adam's obedience. Which one of those is greater? Okay. So you're telling me that what Christ did was greater than what Adam did. And since the cross, I would submit to you that none have been born in Adam. I know you've got to think about that. Because that's the second Adam work was greater and many were made now not all are walking in that because they've not been reconciled to that in their own hearts and minds they've not been awakened to that they've not believed in that unto salvation but it's still true about them I'm just throwing that out there because I believe what Christ did the last Adam did is far greater than what Adam did John 14 41 track with me and he is the last Adam because there's not another one coming. We had the first Adam and the last Adam. We had the first man and the last man. And it wasn't the tool, Tim the tool man Taylor. John 4, 19, 41. At the place where Jesus was crucified, watch this, there was a garden. And in that garden, a new tomb. I've been there. How many of you have been to Israel to see the garden tomb? Yeah beautiful in which no one had ever been laid they laid Jesus there now I'm talking about the resurrection here and it's not Easter but we're heading into Easter but it is important to understand that where he was crucified on that hill there was a garden below it that had a cave and in that beautiful garden I want to say it this way Jesus wasn't buried he was planted I'm going to go on that on Easter Then just a few verses later, it said, Jesus said to her, now the women have gone to the tomb, he's resurrected, his body's not there. Mary steps out of the tomb, she sees this man. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who do you seek? And she, supposing him to be a gardener, isn't it amazing that she would suppose that he was a gardener? Can I submit to you today that he in fact is a gardener? And what... Adam did in the Garden of Eden, turned it into a graveyard. But what Jesus did in a graveyard, turned it back into a garden. And he in fact is the gardener. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, he had entered into a new garden. And as the first Adam was a gardener to tend that Garden of Eden, then the last Adam is the gardener of the Garden of God, which is within man. Why? Where was the seed planted? In you. And we know it's an incorruptible seed. Now, journey with me to Song of Solomon chapter 4. And as you turn there, the old covenant gave us a law that we had to keep. And it led to death. But the new covenant gives us a law that keeps us. Or a law... It gives us a life that keeps us. We're not operating under a set of rules. We're operating under the life that God has given us. And Paul said, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And through that life, we are producing life. And that keeps us. Because the keeping power of the gardener is greater than the plant itself. To keep itself. I want to read four verses. It will be on the screen if you want to follow along and you don't have your Bible with you this morning. Those on the internet can watch 
can see the words there as well. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. Now this is King Solomon, who is a type and shadow of Christ, and the Shulamite woman, who is a type and shadow of the bride of Christ. That would be us, the church. And so the king is saying to the bride, You are a garden, my bride. You are spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices. You are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. Now the voice changes and now she's going to speak. So this is us. This is the church, the bride speaking. Awake north wind, come south wind, blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Would you underline that? We are asking, come Holy Spirit. Come fill us fire and wind. May the wind blow on our gardens, the wind of the Holy Spirit. And there's a purpose for the wind of God blowing across the garden of God in our lives. And it is so that the fragrance would spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. I like the Passion Translation. It says, Then may your awakening breath blow upon my life until I am fully yours. Breathe upon me with your spirit wind. Stir up the sweet spice of your life within me. Spare nothing as you make me your fruitful garden. Hold nothing back until I release your fragrance. Now, John the 15th chapter captures this in the New Covenant. And Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And it goes on to say, and the vine dresser, that's a fancy word for gardener, is the father. Can I tell you, people of God, that you do not produce fruit. Our works, our performance does not produce fruit. The vine, where the nutrients and the resources come from, is what produces the fruit. Nowhere in the scripture can you find where you are to produce fruit. If you've heard that, it's been quoted to you incorrectly. Because the Bible says that you are to bear fruit. The branches bear the fruit. And then the gardener, God Himself, through the Holy Spirit in you, comes and prunes. And that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Because the pruning helps you to grow. And so the vine is where the nutrients and the resources come from the roots. We're going to talk about roots next week. Because what are we rooted in for that plant to grow? But the vine produces and the branches bear the fruit and the gardener who is God comes along. And then I hear Paul in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, say, now thanks be to God who leads us in triumph through Christ and through us diffuses. How many of you have a diffuser? We have one in the hallway at our house right outside of our bedroom. And it makes me feel like I'm at Disney all the time because Lisa buys these oils and things from Disney and it's supposed to smell like Soren or Epcot or the pop century where we stay at the motel. Just all these smells. and that. But if it's not on and if it's not burning and there's not oil in it, then it doesn't produce any fragrance. But can I tell you that you are a diffuser? Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. And Paul said, through us. He diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge. Where? Everywhere we go. Our kingdom responsibility as sons and daughters with the garden of God blowing, growing inside of us and the wind of the Spirit blowing across that garden that when we're at work or we're at the golf course or we're at the marketplace or we're um, at Walmart, wherever we are, whatever we're doing in our homes, at ball games, we should be aware that the fragrance of God should be blowing and diffusing out of us everywhere we go. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ 
among those who are being saved and among those who are per perishing. So it doesn't matter if they're believers or unbelievers. God is using you as a fragrance of Christ. It tells me as believers that we should be acting and talking a certain way. Help me, Jesus. I, I'm, I'm not here to hound on things and, and condemn you, but according to Scripture, because you do have a garden of seed that's been planted in you that's growing and you've awakened to that, then people ought to know it. You know, Paul said that you are saved by grace through faith, not of your no works, least any man should boast. It's not of ourselves. But then James comes along and says that faith without works is dead. Which is it? It's not either or, it's both. Because Jesus, the work that he did through his faith to obey the, what God wanted him to do, we have brand new life. But now that you are, don't finish Ephesians 2, 8, 9 without quoting verse 10, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's why James says faith without works is dead. Why? Because our works show that we are righteous to men. I hope that resonates with you. Because one of the things that happens when you preach grace and you preach it right people will think they can go out and do anything they want to do. Now, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And so the Holy Spirit in you will diffuse the fragrance of Christ, and if we're not yielding to and surrendering to the Spirit that is within us, because, let me tell you something, Dave, I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will keep you from committing adultery. If you'll yield to it. If you surrender. I believe he'll keep you from stealing. I believe that he will keep you from murdering. But it's listening to and yielding to the spirit that is within you. So that what is in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. As the Holy Spirit blows across that garden. Then the fragrance is diffused. And we become a sweet aroma. Look at what the scripture says. The fragrance of Christ everywhere we go. So not a condemning question, not a pointing a finger question, but a contemplative question, what are you diffusing? In the marketplace, at school, at home, am I diffusing Christ to my children? Am I diffusing Christ to my spouse? Uh, let's stay there for a minute as everybody bows their head and closes their eyes. How, what are we diffusing? Now, I believe that the seed has been planted in you. It's an indestructible seed. It's an incorruptible seed. And it's ever growing. So I want to be as the Shulamite woman. The picture of the bride of Christ. And say spirit blow on me. Blow over your garden. And then there are. It's amazing. There are nine manifestations of the fruit of the spirit. Which is love. I believe there's only one fruit of the spirit. And it is love. It doesn't say fruits. It says fruit. In Galatians 5, fruit of the Spirit is love. Then it manifests in kindness, patience, gentleness, long-suffering, all of those uh, nine manifestations of that love. Then there's nine gifts of the Spirit. Well, here in the Song of Solomon, there are nine fruits that I want to quickly go over to you that show us, that let us know what type of fragrance should be diffused from us. Are you ready? Number one, it said the pomegranates of passion. You read verses 13 and 14 in the Passion Translation. It says, Your inward life is now sprouting, bringing forth fruit. What a beautiful paradise unfolds within you. When I am near you, I smell the aromas of finest spices. For many clusters of exquisite fruit now grow within your inner garden. These are exquisite fruits, pomegranates. Pomegranate is taken from the word that means to exalt. Now here recently, we've been sharing with you that from Genesis the first chapter, that when God saw man that he had created and it said he blessed them. So first thing that the scripture says about man, that God blessed them. 
Then he told them to be fruitful, to multiply, and have dominion. But he blessed them. That, that in literation means literally, Christ or God stepped, he bowed down on his knees. He blessed his children and he exalted them. In other words, he gave them a position that as his life is, so is your life. Now it's not arrogance. Matter of fact, the temple pillars, when the temple was built, every one of the pillars were adorned with pomegranates. In other words, it was showing us that God had exalted, because while we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, He lives within us, He had exalted us. Matter of fact, Daniel 1.10 says, he's, he's exalted you far above all your peers. That's not to blow out as an arrogance, but it is to blow out as we exalt Him, that we are exalted in every situation and people want to know why you are succeeding. It's because Christ in you. The second one was henna from heaven. Henna comes from a root word that means ransom price or redemption. The fruit of mercy is seen in His maturing bride. Lisa and I have been talking this week that mercy trumps judgment. So if judgment is coming out of me, that's not the fruit of the henna from heaven. The fruit that He is producing in us as the wind of God blows across us, it should smell like mercy. It should be redemptive. Everything about the cross is redemptive. And if I filter everything I say and do through the cross, then it's going to be redemptive and not judgment. But when it becomes judgment, mercy triumphs jump uh, over judgment. What are, you, what are you diffusing? I have to check my mouth. Is that, was that judgmental towards, towards that individual? Do I need... The, the, the horrible thing about that is once it comes out of my mouth, I can't take it back. It's like trying to push toothpaste back in the tube once it's come out and there are consequences so I have to say Lord forgive me for that Lord help me with that and the next time men this is hard try to think before you speak all the women said amen then there's spike nerd spike nerd is, comes from the root word that means light we walk in the light first John 1 7 says, as he is in the light, and we have fellowship with one another. And in him there is no darkness. So as the fruit of Spikenard, which is the light of God, comes forth, there is no darkness in it. Our words, our demeanor, our actions, our reactions, are they sweet like Spikenard and shedding light? on subject so that the light of God can be seen or does darkness come when we speak the saffron shining saffron is the crocus the lover's perfume costly and fragrant when I look at this one what I, everything should be rooted and grounded in love that's where we're going next week where, where are our roots because if the roots are grounded in love then love is produced and love should come out. How shall they know that we are Christ's disciples unless we what? Love one another. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fragrant calamus from the cross. Calamus is taken from the marsh plant known as sweet flag, which produces fragrant oil. The Hebrew word for this spice means here again purchased or redeemed. It's another fragrance through the oil or the anointing that comes across our life through the Holy Spirit to make everything redemptive. Now, can I pause there for a second and say I, I, I've said that for many years and someone came to me and said I don't want to reconcile or to redeem my past marriage it was awful it was abusive but you're telling me that everything is redemptive what I mean by that is if Gary and I have a toxic relationship 
Gary is a believer, I'm a believer. I love him from a distance, but he can't be a part of my life because it's too toxic for me. But that does not mean that he is not redeemed. That does not mean that I am not redeemed, born again, but blood-bought sons of God. But there are other believers that sometimes when we have disagreements to a certain degree that I just have to separate myself and say, you're a believer, I love you, that's great, you go that way. But I'm a believer, I love God, and I'm going to go that way. You don't have to reconcile the relationship. There needs to be forgiveness there. You need to forgive. But that doesn't mean that you have to reconcile in a relationship. Does that make sense? And then the sacred cinnamon. Cinnamon emits a fragrance that is representative of an odor of holiness to the Lord. This particular anointing oil here is with frankincense, myrrh, and spikenard. Uh, it has cinnamon in it. And the way that I know that this has cinnamon in it is not just by reading it. It's because one time my dad took that and anointed my head and I, it caught on fire. Because the cinnamon in it was so hot. <laughs> I mean, it's like he took a gallon of it and slapped it on my head and... I had a red mark across my forehead from the cinnamon. The mark of God was on me, not the mark of the beast, but the mark of God was on me. So we diluted. There's not, that cinnamon's not going to burn you. I've used it many times here, and there's not been any reactions. Plead the blood of God. But, you know, it was in the recipe for the holy anointing oil that was used by the high priest in anointing the tabernacle and the articles of the temple and it represented holiness. Sons of God, daughters of God, you are not holy by any act that you perform. You are holy because the Holy Spirit indwells within you, and He makes you holy. There is a... Help me, Holy Ghost. There is a standard, there is a responsibility for believers... To live in holiness. Oh, it's quiet. Get back to preaching. I can do anything I want to do. Not without, not without consequences. Hebrews tells us that pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I don't believe that that means that you won't go to heaven. I believe that men won't see God in you if you're not living a holy life. Help me, Jesus. This is just biblical teachings that we already have this in us, but because we focus on other things and not what we've already been given, we don't walk out what's been worked in. That was good. We don't walk out what's been worked in, and then therefore people will call us hypocrites, they will uh, criticize the message because uh, they think that we don't live the way Christ would have us to live because we're doing certain things that they have on their list that are sins. Does that make sense? But you know, if you go to another church, the list changes. <laughs> and so they have other things. And so it may be clothing that makes you holy. Or it may be the length of your hair. Or it may be things that you avoid. If you avoid these things, then I believe that you are holy not by what you wear, not by what you say, not by what... I believe you're holy because the Holy Spirit lives within you. Now, do what He tells you to do. Be, and the only way you know what He wants you to do is to spend time with Him and talk to Him, have communion with Him. I hope that's helping you. It helped me. To know that I am holy and I have I don't have see I tried my whole life to be holy. Thirty seven years as a Christian, living frustrated and condemned because just about the time I got to where they told me I needed to be, they raised the bar. You ever been there? Felt like oh my God, I'm never going to make it because they've raised the bar again. I, it took a secular counselor to tell me that I would never be perfect, and then to hear preaching that tells me I am perfect. 
by not what I do, but because of who I am in Christ. Now, there, He will tell you and He will guide you, and that's what we want to continue to speak forth and to communicate here, is you have a Holy, the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. Can I tell you this? Your kids have the same Holy Spirit. It's not a junior Holy Ghost. They can hear from God. They can learn at a young age how to miss the pitfalls and the detours that they would take by not following the Holy Spirit. Now listen, you have a free will and you can do whatever you want to do and I'm not the sheriff to tell you what to do or not to do. But I am encouraging you that if you'll listen to the Holy Spirit and get permission instead of living out of the uh, old adage, well I'll just get forgiveness. Yeah, God forgives you and He loves you but if you keep walking down that path you're going to live hell on earth. The next one is the branches of scented wood. This is incense. How many of you like to burn incense? Nobody. I like it. Vanilla especially. It's, it's, <laughs> Lisa's going. it's the scented wood that would be burned on the altar in the holy place when the sacrifice was being made. The incense was the praise of the people going up to the Lord. All that I believe that this means is we are an incense to the Lord, but we should be an incense that people smell. Do you know how powerful smell is? I, it, when I smell cinnamon, my mind goes back to 1611 16th Street, Nitro, West Virginia, with a marble slab laid out on the round kitchen table with rock hard candy, and my mama hitting it with a hammer, cracking that cinnamon hard candy. Could smell it throughout the house. You remember? And then to add to the glorious taste was that powdered sugar that she drizzled all over that cinnamon hard candy. But when I smell cinnamon, that's where my mind takes me. S smell is powerful. And I believe that we should be diffusing a fragrance, an incense. Myrrh, like tears from a tree. It's, it, myrrh was known as tears from a tree. And it was a resin spice formed by cutting the, of a tree. It's the picture of the suffering love of Christ and His blood dripping from Calvary's tree to bring us forgiveness. Jennifer, if you can. The last one is aloe. Aloe is considered by many as a healing bomb. The presence of the Lord within her is released as a healing balm to those that she touches. Jesus' robes smelled of aloe. She said, if I could just touch the hem of His garment, I shall be made whole. Revelation, the book of Revelation tells us that we are a tree. It's echoed from Psalm, the first chapter, verse 3, that says the righteous man will be like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Well, the book of Revelation grabs that and tells us as we are a tree to the nations whose leaves bring healing to the nations. And there's a river that runs through. And in the book of Revelation, the trees are on both sides of the river. And the river is what gives the nutrients. It, it Because we have to have water to grow. Jesus is that river. He's the living water. And as He's planted us as trees, then our leaves are healing to the nations. Again, what are we diffusing? Is what we're diffusing healing people or is it hindering people? Because, listen, everybody's hurting. Everybody's broken in some place. Everybody has a battle going on somewhere in their life. Some with jobs. Some with health. Some with relationships with other people. But we all have some place in our life that needs to be touched. And I believe that we are the hands and the feet of Jesus to touch and to bring healing, diffusing that aloe. Man, if, you, if you've ever been sunburned, 
you're thanking God for aloe because it soothes and it cools and it brings healing to areas that have been hurt. Anybody ever been burnt in life? Burnt by a relationship? Burnt by an employer? The ones that really hurt are when we're burnt by those who love us, our family members, our fathers, mothers, children, aunts, uncles, grandparents. Any relationship within a family dynamic, so somewhere along the line we've been burnt. Will you let the aloe fragrance of God be diffused from you? Let's stand together this morning. Would you just begin to contemplate and ask yourself, what am I diffusing? What smell is coming out of my life? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you? To let Him show you what areas... I would say it this way. Just do what the Shulamite woman. Awaken to the gardener this morning. Ask the wind of God to blow over you afresh so that these fragrances would be diffused. It's just some time for you to contemplate and talk to the Holy Spirit. Maybe you want to kneel. Maybe you want to stand. Maybe you want to lay. It doesn't matter the position of your body, but just begin to pray and worship contemplate. Thank you Holy Spirit for speaking to your children. Thank you for revealing to us afresh and anew all that you've given us. May we focus on you the one thing not let our focus be on one thing because that one thing will distract us from diffusing redemption and mercy holiness to the world around us. Healing People all around us as we look at them, Lord, reveal to us how we can be a healing leaf to them through this week. Jennifer, would you sing and you respond. If you want to come to the altar, it's open for you to...